Good afternoon, good, good evening, wherever you're watching. Uh, here we are again for another World War II TV interview. I'm uh, sitting in Bayer in the rain, and my guest, Adam Makos, is sitting in Colorado. What's the weather like with you, Adam? Oh, it's sunny and warm, typical Colorado weather. And I've got you sitting inside during interview. So um, as those who are watching this know, Adam is the uh, best-selling author of three, currently three, uh, individual titles, though you have collaborated in other works as well. Um, I only have two of them here. I was just saying to Adam, I haven't got a hard copy of Spearhead. I've been re reading that on Kindle, but they are as follows. I always plug them. There's a higher call. That's the original classic, the best one that came out a few years ago. Everyone's read that one now. If you haven't, where the hell have you been? Then Adam skips to the Korean War 70 years ago this week, kind of. If that's happening, there's devotion about the uh, pilots in Korea. And then Spearhead is the third armor division in germany in 1945 and adam is working on a new project but we're not going to talk about that only hint at it later on so adam we're, we've been friends for i worked it out we've been friends for about 12 years i think approximately um so um yeah where have the years gone i i, I um it seems like yesterday i was taking you and brian and your sister around normandy and apparently it was 12 years ago so amazing we amazing Tom Malarkey was with us and Earl McClung. We were actually, yeah. we were walking with the greats of the Band of Brothers unit. Yeah, it was an amazing time. So, um, well, anyway, thank you for joining me, Adam. And, um, you know, I, I, as we're getting this World War II TV thing off the ground, it's always, uh, the, the trick is to go to people you know, go to your friends first, rather than you start with the historians you don't know, you start with the people you know. And uh, I know you and all, all, the, all the family, uh, so, um, Thank you for joining us. Um, it's um, a pleasure to have you here, Adam. And um, it's, it's, it's my honor. Um, I tell everybody, I say the expert for Normandy, uh, which is, of course, for America, D-Day, the whole campaign, that's our best known campaign in World War II. It's our biggest battle as far as most people are concerned. Um, it's the one that's gotten the most uh, celebration by authors and movie makers. And you could say it's our, 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 our chief interest as Americans, D-Day. Uh, you're the expert. You're the guide. I, I always tell people, uh, if I have a question, I go to Paul. And when I tour a battlefield, I go to Paul. And so it's, it's, it's an honor for me to talk to somebody who is preeminent in his field and that, that you are. Well, thank you for that. A mutual backslapping session there never does any harm. So no, it's, uh, well, thank you very much for saying that. I'm one of but you believe it, I'm one of about 150 tour guides in Normandy now. When I started here uh, years ago, there was about 10 of us that specialized in World War II, and now there's 150 approximately. Some people say it's more than that. Obviously, there's no work this year. Well, very little. The French and Dutch have just started to come the last couple of weeks, but we're not going to see any Americans, at least in the summer. But anyway, that I, I digress. So, um, Adam, uh, let's before we talk about the three books, let's go back to the, the beginning, because you're your um your path to be a best-selling author kind of started a little bit smaller didn't it with your brother brian um with an aviation magazine when you weren't you were in your teens weren't you so tell us about how you actually started uh it's probably not that long ago to compare to some of the people watching this who are in their 50s and 60s but um for you as in your as a youngster a mere in your 30s something but it was how did it, this this aviation magazine tell me about that well, well, the story can actually give a lot of encouragement to other young people who might be watching this because uh, we started when we were 15 or 16 years old, and it started just as a little homemade newsletter. It was a rainy day. My brother, my best friend, Joe, uh, my sister, Erica, eventually came on board. We started a little newsletter about veterans' stories. Uh, we loved growing up hearing our grandfather's stories from World War II, going to museums and air shows. And, and so it, it just was a little homemade newsletter. We simply wanted to do what you and what many, many of our uh, fellow historians do, and that is to just wake people up to the importance of, of what happened 75 years ago. And when you're a kid in middle school, that's pretty hard to do. So we started this little newsletter. We said, we're gonna share it with our friends. We started getting subscribers. And before you know it, it became a magazine. And so we were going to college and we were coming home on the weekends, missing all the parties, all the fun. And we were working on this little magazine about veteran stories. And that thing went for 15 years. Um, but it was kind of our training wheels. It's where we were learning to interview. We were learning about taking little diverse bites of all kinds of history stories. So one day you might be working on a story set in the Pacific. Next day you're working on a story set in Italy. 
And we got really lucky along that way. Um, we started one day selling artwork. It was a fundraiser for our little magazine. We figured you could sell one piece of artwork, a limited edition print showing a scene of history. And it's the equivalent of selling a whole box of magazines. And we found this gentleman who became our patron saint. Uh, we were in Pennsylvania, as you mentioned, and he lived down the road in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So we came to him and we said, we want to make an art print of your unit. We'd like to sell it as a fundraiser for our little magazine. Would you help us? And at that time, he was the most famous veteran in the whole world because a series had just come out 2001 called Band of Brothers. And his name was Dick Winters. And so we were just kids knocking on his door in Hershey saying, will you help us? And true to his character, Dick Winters made an exception where he would have turned other people away. And he said, come on in, guys. Wow. I mean, that's, and that was obviously your youth that did that because, you know, I, I had a couple of telephone calls with Dick. I didn't know him, but I knew people like Bill Garnier and, you know, through you and others, the other guys, it was the fact that he, he had this obsession almost with passing things on to a younger generation. Um, and perhaps if you'd been 20 years older going in there, it, it wouldn't have worked. It was your youth, I think, that got you in the door. And then your passion was, was the, was the, the, the deal sealer, if you like. Um, and I think when you said about interviewing veterans, um, that registered with me, because like you, I've met hundreds of them. And when you think back, well, I do, to the ones you met at the beginning, and you think, oh, God, I, I asked some ridiculous questions, and why did I go down that way? And you learn over the years. You're part psychiatrist, part confessional, part um, analyst, part um, detective, um, CSI cop, and you roll it all together. and and it's a skill it's a skill and you do it very well and when we come to discuss the books later on and of course i am a fan of the books and i'm and i would be whether or not i knew you anyway um your ability to get them to emote and and go beyond just that i went through that town on that date which alas so many books about veterans are a little bit just detail detail this date this date this date you you you, you cut through to the the emotions so um Practicing your skills on Dick Winters. I mean that you, that was a that was a he took no prisoners, did he? So obviously you you had to you had to shape up pretty quick. Tell us about those first encounters. You must have been, and I'm gonna use a nice English expression, shitting yourself the first time you sat in his living room. I mean, really, that must have been terrifying. Oh, he was he was very otherworldly, Paul. He uh the guy you see in the miniseries before every episode, after some of them. He, uh, winners always thought before he spoke, it's something a lot of us don't do, I can't do it, but he would always, he had that pensive way where he would take it in and he'd kind of ponder it and then he'd come back to you with something philosophical and brilliant. And when you read about how he lived his life, he was very introspective. He was, he was all about becoming the best person he could be. He was everything you saw in the series and more. And so, so when you sat next to him, you, you had to have your questions right. You had to ra he, he lifted you up to his level and he encouraged you to, to, to basically be sharper than you were. Um, one of the things he taught me that I always thought was interesting was he always said uh, the key to his leadership was fairness. Whether it's whether you're running a business or a military unit, treating people fairly uh, was his secret. And he said, they will treat you fairly. So he would always tell me, Adam, treat your team fairly, treat the people you work with fairly, treat the stories fairly. And, um, and that was really, really interesting. Cause he, I had to, I, I faced a challenge when I was working with him. I did a story about the Normandy paradrop and I had to write about his side of the story and the C-47 pilots. And anybody who knows about D-Day knows there's this big controversy between the paratroopers and the pilots. The paratroopers say they dropped us all over hell and back. Uh, they scattered us. Our guys die. They dropped too low. They dropped too high. And the pilots say, well, you weren't there in the cockpit. It was, a, it was hell. And we were, you know, there was, there's this whole debate. So I tried to balance stories I was getting from the pilots and from Dick Winters and Forrest Guth and Bill Garnier and, and the other Easy Company men. We published the story. I sent it to Dick Winters. And one day I got a phone call in the office. My brother picked up and he said, he said, Adam, it's, it's major winners. And I went over, it was at night, about seven or eight o'clock. And I picked up the phone. I said, yeah, yes, sir. Hello, major winners. And he said, he said, Adam, he said, I am shocked. And then he went silent. 
And my first thought was, ah, oh, I screwed up. You know, I botched it. And I'm about to get chewed out by my hero, the hero of every World War II buff on earth. And he said, you nailed it. He said, this is the most beautiful piece I've ever read, the most fair and balanced. And he just went on and on. And so suddenly I, my, my soul came back into my body. But he, he, he spent time just congratulating us on this story. And, and then you know what he did? He took this magazine and he sent it out to Los Angeles and he got it signed by Tom Hanks for us and he sent it back to us. So I've got this magazine article that I wrote that says, you know, it's Tom Hanks and Silver, Silver Margaret. But that's the kind of guy Dick Winters was. Um, you know, he just, he would go out of his way. This guy didn't have to do anything like that. Instead, he presents me with a magazine signed by Tom Hanks and and he he showed that fairness really mattered to him and so so that was just one of those lessons when you when you rub shoulders with a guy like that it can't help but shape the rest of your life well no indeed and um i mean what an amazing start i mean how 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 better to get off the ground than that and by the way for those watching adam's saying there about the troop carrier pilots on monday night's show we're doing an air power in normandy show and i've got mike beck told uh, Adam Berry and Matt Bone on, and Adam Berry is a troop carrier expert, and that is one of the topics we're going to discuss: the uh, the rather maligned uh, troop carrier um, performance on D-Day, which frankly is not really the case. They did a fantastic job, and the parachute infantry regiment commanders actually praised them after D-Day. So we're going to tackle that on Monday, but we'll get back to Adam now. I just thought I'd throw that in there as it came up in conversation. So um, yeah, um, amazing start. So. Um, the uh, the magazine then leads to the art print and you, you the encounter with Dick Winders and we'll talk about Valor Studios and you're you're still involved with that along with the entire family it seems um, and now you're marrying and bringing people in for that there's more now that with Brian's Brian's hitched and that's so um, the, the the empire is expanding so that's good so there's more more projects more prints coming and. Uh, you're working on a couple and, and I'm privileged that you always send me little pictures and things and, and, and ask my advice and uh, you can ask anybody but you seem to ask me so that's nice um so let's get back to the books because um you know I've got 1200 books plus on World War II in my room and um there's a plethora of books that are broadly similar to what you do in that they take a veteran or a veteran or two stories and they spread it out life stories and they go through and have a resolution there's a lot of them that said a lot of them aren't that good in that they are they're not very well written and and i'm not going to mention any names of course what strikes me about your books and i've, I've written my notes here mm -hmm. and i want to know your a bit about your creative process because you always have re really strong themes of duty, redemption, uh, forgiveness, um, tolerance. And I think the reason your book, well, they're well written, but the reason your books are so well regarded is they do tackle these things. I mean, devotion tackles racism, which of course is a massive great topic right now in 2020 with what's going on in the USA. And I mean, you don't, it's not the main part of the book at all, but it's, it's there as an ever present theme there. So do you choose your books do you choose a theme and find top? How how does the process of um, combining the two begin for you? Hmm. You know, Paul, I, I, having talked about Dick Winters and, and his lessons on fairness, I think that is a theme now that you know, I really put some thought into it. All these stories, whether it's a higher call story of Franz Diegler, Luftwaffe pilot, and Charlie Brown, the American bomber pilot who, who meet in the skies of World War II, or it's a story of Tom Hudner, uh, a white pilot from the country club scene in the Korean War era, and Jesse Brown, a sharecropper's son, uh, African-American from Mississippi, who become friends. Uh, or it's the story of Clarence Schmoyer, the German tank gunner in Spearhead, or sorry, the American tank gunner, who meets his German adversary, Gustav Schaefer. So you've got men from different worlds who come together, sometimes in battle, sometimes just brought in from different circumstances, who come away as friends. And so for me, I think these stories are all about fairness. It's um, that lesson winners taught me. It's easy to look at the German side, for example, in a higher call. And when I first went out to Franz Stiegler to meet him, I thought, these guys are all Nazis. These guys are all pretty rotten dudes. I don't even know why I'm coming out here. 
But Charlie Brown, the American bomber pilot said, if you want my story, you have to go to Franz first. You have to hear the German story. You have to take the time to be fair. He didn't say be fair, but that's essentially mm -hmm. what his message was. He said, in this story, the German's the hero. I'm just a character. And so, you know, you had guys like Winners encouraging me to, to explore this. You had Charlie Brown pushing me into it. And I think I just learned that uh, the best way to tell a war story is to tell a story that resonates on a human level. And the best way to do that is to show both sides. Because when you just tell our side, you know, our tanks are rolling over the Germans and we're just crushing stuff and we're blowing up things and we're conquering towns, you get this sort of one-sided emotion. And that is, I lost a buddy or, or we're, we're kicking butt. You know, it's that kind of I'm scared, I'm, I'm, I'm victorious. It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very limited gamut of, of emotions. But when you get to the other side and you start looking at this young German who's being sent to battle this American tanker um, and you see their lives about to collide and you say, wait a second, that, they're both sharing the same fears. They're both sharing the same hopes. Neither of them wants to be there. And one of the lines in, in Spearhead, the new book that I really loved, it was just a thought you think late at night and then you put it in a book. But it was that Clarence Schmoyer, our American hero, didn't want to be there. He wanted to be back home roller skating. That was his thing. Roller skating with his friends, just an average 21-year-old kid. Gustav Schaefer, the German, didn't want to be there either. His thing was watching the trains go by on the Hamburg-Bremen line. So on a Sunday, he would get his bicycle and he'd bicycle to the tracks and he'd sit there with a picnic basket and he'd watch the trains go because he wanted to be a locomotive conductor someday. And so that, that's where the reality of World War II really hits hard is when you realize neither wanted to be there both are going through the same hell and they both as shifty powers famously said you know we might have been good friends we might have been fishing buddies maybe he liked to hunt like i like to hunt you know that line from band of brothers you know you couldn't put it better that's the reality of it maybe he maybe we would have been good friends under different circumstances i mean that's what i like about your work because i'm, I'm going back to higher higher call um it's broadly similar to books i read as a kid about the battle of britain pilots and the luftwaffe pilots mm -hmm. but where you take it to a different level is you do acknowledge like you just said there about the fact that that the the, the the air the war in the air is not representative of what's happening on the ground and it's not and sometimes these british accounts were a bit too they were saying that this chivalry was commonplace and it, it and and you're reading that thinking, hang on, but my great angle was down on the ground and there wasn't much chivalry down the ground. You don't shy away from that. In your books, it would be an easy trap to just play this gallantry chivalry asset, but you don't. You bring it down, you, and you know, in, in devotion, you you acknowledge the fact that there's racism going on. You could have you could have done the book all about brotherhood, but you don't. You're all, you always bring in the things that would have been easier in some ways to leave out. Uh, and the fact that Clarence didn't really want to be there because it's much easier to just say, Oh yeah, he was a hero. He wanted to win the war and kick ass and, and bring, bring freedom to Europe. And you, you didn't put that in. And I, I, I have to say, I, I respect you for doing that. And, uh, and that's why I think your books are doing so remarkably well, because they are, I would love to know I have to ask you now, what's the demographic? Do you get, I would get you, and I'm, I'm going to sound awfully sexist to be watching. I get, I bet you get a wide range of ages, and I get you be, get both sexes, both genders, and wide lots of nationalities reading your books. Whereas I know there are friends of mine who write histories who are written by geeky middle-aged guys in tweed, and that's the only readership. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you, so your, your readership, it's across the board, isn't it? Yeah, it is, Paul, and I'm so fortunate. It is uh, when we were doing the signings for Spearhead. I remember seeing more young people, and we're, we're talking even kids, sometimes nine years old, 10, 12. And, and there's moments where I, I think to myself, wait, you know, I tell the mother, you know, should he, do you really want him reading about tank battles at night and the German tank crew coming out on fire after Clarence shoots him? And, and the mother says, yeah, you know, this, this really happened. He needs to know this. And, and guess what? He loves this stuff. And so I, I kind of believe sometimes in this old soul, young soul thing. I mean, it's a little mm. inappropriate for this, but uh, I believe that there's sometimes these young kids that, that must have lived through World War II in a previous life because they're standing there in line holding the spearhead book. 
one of them brought me up a picture he had drawn, he and his brothers. One, it was a green Sherman tank running over something. Another, I, I was like, wait a second, that's a panther. So he drew a panther tank. It has a little black cross on it, the Balkan cruise. It's on fire and there's crewmen coming out. And it's literally, and he wrote German officer. So he's drawing a picture of the Panther tank coming up in flames that he saw in the newsreel footage that will show people from Cologne, the real footage. And part of me is like, oh my God, this kid is drawing burning uh, you know, German soldiers. And the other part of me is like, well, you know what? I'd rather he'd be learning about this history and learning that people actually went into the streets of Cologne and risked their lives when they were 21 years old. And some of them are resting in European soil. They never turned 19, they never turned 20, they never turned 22. And so, you know what? I'd rather him be learning about that stuff even at an early age than, you know, playing Pokemon all day or something. And it's real violence. I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with people understanding that violence is real and that people, there's consequences of, of, of evil actions. Because nine-year-old boys are playing video games anyway. I'm, I'm generalizing, but I'm sure they are, like I was when I was nine or 10. And there were video games back then, viewers. They just weren't as sophisticated as today's ones. But um, so understanding real footage, I think, is and, and real um, impact of combat. There's no, there's no too, age too young for that. I've got a very good friend, Alina, who's a tour guide. Uh, in Poland and, and is an Auschwitz Holocaust survivor and she kind of believes there's no there's no there's no you can't be too young to understand about the Holocaust really it just how is how you communicate it to it through someone mm -hmm. um, but as this came up in conversation that, about this footage of, of Cologne I, I it's the fir first for World War II TV and I'm going to actually play a bit of World War II footage that's available online and it's um a sequence that it's it's silent but I think Adam can provide a bit of commentary on it and it's the it's a sequence taken in Cologne towards the end of the war, 1945, of American tanks, the Third Armored Division, engaging German Panthers. And um, I'll bring it up and uh, start it and then see if you can comment on it, if you wouldn't mind. It's only two minutes long, folks. Don't, don't get too excited. So I'll get it ready for us. So there we go. Is it playing? Yeah, it's playing, Paul. I can see it. Good, good, good. So what's happening there, Adam? Well, what we see here is how the Cologne tank duel started. Carl Kellner was, uh, his tank was, his Sherman was ambushed outside the Cologne Cathedral. And basically the radio call went out. Uh, a Panther tank has parked itself at the cathedral. It's knocked out two of our tanks. And this shirt, this Pershing, uh, Clarence Schmoyer's Pershing, Clarence was a gunner. Bob Early, Sergeant Bob Early was the commander. You can see him there on the left in the turret. Uh, you can also see the loader, John DeRiggi. And this Pershing tank was tasked with leading the U.S. Army. Here they're going into Cologne. You can see the Pershing at the, at the forefront. You can see it firing. This Pershing is now driving forward to battle the German tank. Basically, when we went into Cologne, they said, we're going to put the best tank first. We're going to send the Pershing first. That's dangerous for the men in that Pershing because, and there's it actually taking the shot and hitting the Panther tank because that means you're always going first, you're always in the crosshairs of the enemy. And this footage was quite remarkable because an army cameraman put himself in a building looking down at this German tank and he was hoping it wouldn't see him, he was hoping it wouldn't shoot him. And what he captured was some of the best footage of World War II. Uh, this is the crew immediately after they destroyed the Panther tank. You see them come out of the turret, uh, they're all smoking, this is five minutes after they literally looked death in the eye because that, that tank duel was um, highly unusual in that they thought they were gonna catch the enemy looking the other way. They thought the German Panther was aiming down the street where it had knocked out Carl Kellner's Sherman. And in the time it took, the way the duel went down that was so fascinating, this German tank pulls forward from a tunnel, uh, a railway tunnel, it knocks out two Shermans, parks in front of the cathedral, and it's looking down, let's say, Street A, where the Shermans are. The Pershing is on Street B. They get the call, there's a panther there. And that's when the, the commander, Bob Early, does something remarkable. He and the cameraman get out on foot, and they go up the street, they sneak into a building, and they do reconnaissance, and they literally look at this panther tank. 
they see it and, and, and they plan this. I mean, this is like they were going to make a viral video. It's <laughs> like they're going to do a TikTok or something. And they decide, okay, you have the camera ready. You're going to hear me come up the street. I'm going to shoot it and you're going to catch it on film. It's going to be amazing. I don't know where Bob Early, the commander, uh, found the, the courage and bravery and confidence to do that. But I think it had something to do with the fact that that German tank was looking down street A and it wasn't looking where they would be coming. So they were gonna come and get a broadside of this German tank. It was gonna go up in flames, it was gonna be beautiful. So Early runs back to the Pershing, gets in the turret, gives a plan to his crew, tells them what he's just seen. Meanwhile, Jim Bates, the cameraman, is filming this Panther. And we will never know to this day if the German tank commander, Bartleborth, Wilhelm Bartleborth, whether or not he had a sixth sense that this American tank was gonna come from a different direction, or if he or one of his crewmen saw Jim Bates putting his camera in that window. Because you know, that Panther mm. in the cool, uh, you know, it had mirrors 360. So he might've seen Bates positioning his camera and he turned his gun 90 degrees to the right and he's watching an empty street, Street B. And that's where Clarence Schmoyer's tank, Bob Early's tank comes up. And these two tanks, both have their guns positioned where the other one will be. And so it's, it's one of history's most incredible duels. I always wondered how did, at first you always say, oh, you know, we just are better shots and our tank is better. And then when you get into the records, you find out that when these two tanks came face to face, the German commander actually said, hold your fire. It's one of ours. And it was a split second decision he made because he had never seen a Pershing tank before. He had only seen those stubby, tall, upright Sherman tanks. He had been blasting them for a long time. You know, he had a, 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 an advantage over them. I mean, it was, it was David versus Goliath. And suddenly when he saw this Pershing, he hesitated. So what is that? Is that one of ours? And that gave our guy, Clarence, the, time, the chance to get the first shot in. And by the time the first shot was in that Panther, the battle was over. German crew starts pouring out and the battle is won. And Bates captured the footage that we just showed everyone. So uh, it's a powerful moment in Spearhead. But the funny thing is, it isn't the end of the story. A lot of people would have said, oh, there's the end. We won. They lost. No, that was actually a defeat in a lot of ways for Clarence Schmoyer. We got lucky is the way he put it. And it would haunt him. It would haunt him in the next battles to come. So the biggest battle in Spearhead is still to come. And it's when... Clarence would go against a bigger enemy uh, in a more, more harrowing environment. And that is when they would attack the German, the Nazi Fort Knox, as they called it, going up against the, the last tanks on the Western Front, some of the last German tanks, and some of the best German tank gunners. So, so the battle in Cologne for Clarence was a wake-up call. It wasn't the end. No, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. And um, I don't want to go too geeky into tanks, but the, well, a little bit. I mean, the Pershing was of course, on paper, better than the Sherman and better than the Panther. But we have, what, 20 or 30 of them in the entire European theater of operations. We've only had them for a few weeks. So new things are always slow to get up to the speed of um, our lesser quality, but familiar, familiar, familiarity of the Sherman. So the Pershing, in the, as I would call it, the top trumps comparison, if you compare barrel gun, armor, it completely beats the Sherman and completely beats a Panther, but only if you've got good, it's only as good as the crew, it's only as good as the, uh, the, um, the, the spares for it, the, the, uh, the, 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 the practice, the technique. I mean, most Panther crews, and I'll let you talk about the German crew in a minute, most, pan, most Panther crews by 45 have been doing it for a substantially long time and are very good at what they do. Otherwise they'd have been dead way earlier in the war and if they have if they are themselves our newish crew they are still coming off the experience of a good three or four years of using using these things where that is being passed down by the training cadres of don't do this make sure you do that always go on this side of that make sure that you don't use your gun at this range the pershing is going into combat with no back catalog of experience to, to compare to and i think although we're not going to go into that to that detail but how long had that german crew um been been together well we know the commander had been in the military since 38 and that's where you can sometimes draw these lines when you talk about germans um 
you know, were there good Germans, were there bad Germans? And, you know, you can debate this forever. I mean, one time I said, this crew was a bunch of fanatics, this Nazi Panther crew, you know, they're, they're there fighting to the last round when other Germans throughout the city are all surrendering. And some people took me to task and they said, well, if this was an American crew, wouldn't they fight to the last round if it was one of their cities? And so I had yeah. to rethink that. Um, this commander had been in since 38. He had been a tank instructor. So he had been in combat. Then he went back to instruct in, in tanks. Then he's put back on the front line. So vast amount of experience. He's got a gun that can shoot for a, practically a mile on a line. Uh, you know, our Shermans, we used to have to kind of almost lob. You have to count, compensate for distance because your shell is going to be sinking. Panther tank just absolutely, they called it a super velocity gun. It was just absolutely brutal. So a lot of our guys, you know, Clarence Schmoyer, 21 years old, he's been in combat for maybe four or five months um, as a gunner. You know, he's he's learning on the job. And that was what was so fascinating about studying the American side of it. The Germans knew what to do. They knew how to how to hide and defoade, take a shot, knock the tank out, relocate. They were like a they were using their tanks like snipers would in the Battle of the Bulge, for example. So you one of your guys would get hit. Everybody, the radio calls would go out. You'd see it burning. You'd see your guys uh, pouring out of the tank. You just lost friends. There's a German tank up there, one o'clock, uh, you know, X, Y, Z distance. And then by the time they actually deployed the Shermans and started flanking and started maneuvering, the German's gone because he's pulled back, set up to take the next shot. And so they were deadly smart. And guys like Clarence were, were fighting through instinct. One of the things he did that was so tremendous, um, in Cologne, he encountered this German tank before the Panther, crewed by Gustav Schaefer, our little German, uh, you know, you might say, uh, protagonist in, in Spearhead. Gustav was barely five foot tall. He's uh, just turned 18 in, in battle, and he's a crewman on a Mark IV Panzer. Clarence in this Mark IV came face to face down a long boulevard in Cologne. The Mark IV pulled back behind a building. So what does Clarence do? He knows this German tank is there. He can't go forward. It's going to get a broadside on him. So he comes up with this very American, very innovative idea. We've got the shells to waste. Why not? So he switches to, uh, he has some armor piercing shells. He's got some high explosive. He starts shooting through the building, trying to hit the German tank. And when he sees that the building is slowly collapsing, he says, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to knock a building over on him. So he stops trying to find where this German tank is and he shoots the damn building over on him. And don't you know the bricks fall on this Mark IV? They get lodged between the turret and the, the hull. The gun gets a little bit uh, askew and the German crew is starting to say, what are we gonna do? Do we stay here? Do we shoot when he comes up? And Gustav says the hell with this. I'm done serving the Third Reich and I'm not gonna die for the Third Reich. They sent us here to die because in his case, they sent three German tanks over the bridge into Cologne. They said, go, go, go. Fight the American army that's coming. Do your duty to the fatherland. And then they blew up the bridge behind him. So it was essentially a one-way trip. It was a suicide mission. Mm, wow. That's where this young 18-year-old said, I'm done being a pawn for, for Hitler. And I'm done with this idea of I owe my life to my country. You know, they sent me here to die. And you know what? I want to live. And I'm done fighting. And that's where he got out of the tank and he ran away and he hid and he, he survived the war. Had he chosen otherwise, he probably would have never left that city alive. And we wouldn't have written a book called Spearhead because it would be a one-sided story, just an American tank crew fighting their way through Germany. No, because he lived, we found him and we got this one in, I wouldn't say one in a million, it's more than that. I'd say it's like one in a hundred million, one in, you know, one in a billion story, really. Two enemies finding each other 70 years later. I mean, it's extraordinary stuff. And I think I'm going I'm to bring it back to a couple of things that we said earlier. One, well, you said it, you said um, about D-Day being the one everyone talks about, Normandy, uh, and you're right. And uh, for every Normandy book, or every 10 Normandy books, you get one about this last part of the war. And, uh, and Korea, I mean, Devotion, there's a pitifully few books on the Korean War com compared to World War II or World War One or even Vietnam, I think. It seems to be the overlooked one. Um, but this period of, of the Cologne, the fighting there, because you've got the two characters there, you've got the tank commander from 1938, who possibly is now acting like a kind of cornered animal now, in that he's, there's nothing to lose now. 
He's seeing the Germany he knew crumble around him. So you might as well go out in a blaze of glory and, and die, whatever the cause is. And again, you get another kid who's 18 who says, I don't want any part of this. So you've got a completely different reaction. You are, and the idea of using your shells to knock out the building is, is fantastic because that comes back to uh, James Holland always talks about the big war we allies have by then where we have got the amount of shells and bombs to just waste in that sense the germans by that point haven't even got enough for their job they're trying to do let alone waste rounds on knocking down walls so i think the 19 the march april may 1945 era is there's a lot of mileage there that people are ignoring because it seems oh well we've won by then you know after the battle of the bulge the war is over and in the big sense yes the war is not going to go any other way except ours then but there's still some amazing amazing um stories there so um yeah, no, thanks for sharing the details of that of that tank. It's on my I've, my backdrop today. I've chosen the, the print of the two tanks, um, possibly slightly closer there for artistic license there, but amazing, amazing uh, uh, um, story there. Um, yeah. So it, it makes me want to ask you again, Adam, I'm going to bring it up again, this idea of this finding these themes. I mean, do you think you find them or do you think they find, have you just been lucky they found you? Well, what's, I mean, you seem to, like you, you say, one in a hundred million You've been you've been really you've you've written great books, but you've been really lucky to have three absolutely amazing stories. I mean, so do you think they find you? That's gonna be my question. Are they finding you the stories? You know, Paul, I I do feel there is an element of that, and and I, I never want to get too spooky with it or, or you know too philosophical. But the fact that the story of a higher call, Franz Stiegler and Charlie Brown, it had been told for. A good decade or more by the time I came around those guys reunited in 1990 I met them I want to say early 2000s so so it had been around why hadn't anybody else told that story why hadn't anyone else written that book it waited there and I I got to be the first why hadn't anybody told the story of Tom Hudner and Jesse Brown somehow I got to be the first so I get lucky like that now the story of Spearhead is is really funny because I had a friend in college who first told me about Clarence Smoyer. Clarence was in his hometown. Clarence must have been in his 80s then. And my friend Pete Seminoff used to say, you got to interview Clarence Smoyer. Well, I was working on my little magazine and it really, I, I didn't know anything about tanks. I was doing mostly aviation stuff. And I said, I'll, I'll get to it someday. Well, a few years passed by, never interviewed Clarence Smoyer. But I saw Pete in Iraq. I went there as a journalist just for two weeks. And he said, hey, did you interview Clarence Smoyer? And we're sitting there out, out at night as helicopters are flying over and we're sitting on his base smoking cigars. And I said, no, I haven't interviewed him quite yet. Maybe when I go home. Well, I go home, another five years passes, didn't interview Clarence. And uh, I go to Pete's wedding and Pete said, have you interviewed him yet? And I said, no, no. He said, all right, you owe me a wedding gift, a really good one. Tomorrow, you're going to interview Clarence Smoyer. Now, most people never sober up at a wedding because they have an interview the next day, but Clarence lived 30 minutes from there. And so I was cut off at that point. I'm working tomorrow. And to, to give my friend a wedding gift, I went and I knocked on the door of Clarence Schmoyer. Clarence lets me in, tells me these stories. And then he says, wait a second, I've got something you might like. And I hear, I thought it was just a story of that black and white film, a guy shooting a German tank. Okay, that's tremendous. And he said, I'm in touch with the German I fought against. You know, I found him and I've got a letter from him and let me get his name for you. It's Gustav Schaefer. Let me get his address. And suddenly, Paul, the light bulbs are going on because, you know, this is a higher call happening all over again. And German might be alive and maybe Clarence is going to go meet him and maybe I could be there and I could take photos and I could take notes. This is a story I fought against. I didn't want to do this story. I, for years, I didn't care about tanks. I just didn't understand them. And yet the universe, literally, my friend and, and circumstances pushed me. And then three months later from that, I'm standing in Cologne watching Clarence Smoyer and Gustav Schaefer approach each other with their hands out to meet for the first time. So sometimes I go kicking and screaming into these and it makes me feel like I am led to them. There have been a couple books that I've chased where I thought, oh, this is a great story. And I've gone to the reunion with the veterans and I've started asking around. I bought all the books and I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And don't you know, it always falls through. Somebody else has done it or, or the veterans are just too tired to talk or the, the guy I needed had just died. And I come home and I'm dejected. I say, I just lost a great story. 
And then I go on and do something like Spearhead instead. And so the stories I try to chase, you know, they say it's kind of like dating, you know, it's uh, the people you try to chase, you know, you're out there trying to chase a girl, um, never works. When you let the universe work and when you let, let things unfold as they should, you walk through doors that are open to you instead of trying to knock them down or, you know, uh, force your way through them. Well, that's amazing stuff. So, um, I mean, you've, you're still young, you've got another 10 in you, I guess, but, um, you know, to have such great ones to begin with, I mean, you, you, the thing is you set the bar really high now. That's the only, the only danger is, is kind of, the, 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 it's the, diff, what they call it in rock, the difficult fourth album, you know, that is, you know, you've, you've, you've done three Sergeant Peppers effectively, and you've got to do a follow up, you know, and it's, it's, oh, you're putting pressure on yourself all the time, but, um, it's, I, I'm, I, as I said, I mean, I was preparing the questions for this and I, and I, I don't do it too much prep. I, I, you know, I know the books anyway, but it's, it's the, it's the, stru the strength of the themes. I think that's why your books will stand the test of time is this, there's, that they encapsulate this, I, these ideas, I say, of reconciliation and forgiveness and tolerance and, and, and prejudice. And, and they, they, they challenge us a bit when we read them as well. They challenge us to think about ourselves. And I think that's, if you can make World War II, and your detail about studying the the, the, the battles is, is is second to none, but you're also making them incredibly relevant. There's some books you read for about World War II that are stuck in the decade they were written in, that have nothing to say to me anymore now, and it's just you kind of read them for the information, but they they're a burden to read, and I can't honestly ever see your books being a burden to read for anybody. Um, so. I mean, we, we, we discussed before we went on live that we're, we're not going to go in to details of your, your, your next project, but for those watching, there is one. <laughs> we're just not going to tell what it is. Um, but um, let's, let's bring it back to this idea. You know, you, you had this incredible encounter very early on with Dick Winters, and you've now met American and German veterans. Um, forget the books. You as an individual, Adam, what has it been? What, how has meeting these guys influenced your life? What mm. will you take for when you're bringing up, when you've got the, the grand, the, the Makos grandchildren, there could be potentially dozens of them with all, with all the, you know, your brothers and sisters. What will you be sitting, what will they be when they're sitting on your knee? What will, what will you be telling them about how you met World War II veterans? Hmm. Man, Paul, that's a, uh, that is, uh, I almost want to think about it for a minute and turn it back on you. I mean, you wrote a book, Angels of Mercy, um, which is another one of those humanitarian stories. And, and you've, you know, you've led battlefield tours for so many of the veterans who've come back. Um, I want to know how, I, I'd like to know what you feel when you do this. I, I guess for me, just to answer it simply is um, I, I've, I've gained an appreciation for the fact that I live in 2020 America for all of its mm. warts and flaws, whatever strike there is. I, I I don't have anybody sending me off to fight, uh, you know, on Guadalcanal, taking a steamship, you know, uh, that would take three days or four days to, you know, cross the Pacific to, or longer, weeks even. Uh, nobody is, is putting me into a landing craft and saying, you know, you're, the ramp is going to drop and you're going to have to charge the bluffs. And nobody is saying, we need you to get in that V-17 and go up to 25,000 feet and in sub-zero cold and people are going to shoot at you and if your plane gets hit it's going to spiral out of the sky and chances are pretty good this centrifugal force is going to pin you against the wall and you're going to die screaming you know pinned against the metal ribbing of a b-17 or a b-24 it's not like the movies where you're always going to find a way to live and i think we consider our lives to be so precious today i wouldn't go there i wouldn't do that i wouldn't Back then, these young guys just said, all right, I'm, I'm going to get in that B-17. I'm going to fly a, you know, eight-hour mission over Germany. I'm going to go through this hell, and I'm going to do it 30 times. And, and to me, you know, Clarence Smoyer getting told, your tank is leading the way. You're going into the city of Cologne. There's uh, Germans with Molotov cocktails on the roofs. That's what they were told. There's 88-millimeter cannons dug in at the ground level. The basements have tunnels. So the German with the Panzerfaust can jump out of a door, shoot you, shoot your tank, fill it with this molten lead and molten metal that's going to turn you all into Swiss cheese. And then he's going to disappear and he's going to emerge down the block with another Panzerfaust. 
and there's a German tank and you might just come around the, the corner if you're not quick enough, you're gonna die. And so there's just so many times these guys said, send me, you know, I'll go first. I'll, I'll, I'll lead the way, I'll take the bullet. And it's unfathomable to me in a lot of ways. So I'm thankful for my life. And I'm more thankful for those guys who lived 70 years ago, because I think they were far braver than I'll ever be. And uh, I'm still trying to understand who they were and how they did what they did with every book I write. Yeah, I mean, I, when you were saying that, the thought that came into my head about you're talking about this idea of, um, of, of duty and serving with one another, is this, I'm not gonna go into politics, but this, this mask wearing business, you know? I wear a mask when I go out into public, not for me, I do it for other people because I hope that they will do it for me. It's, it's not about you, it's about other people. And I think probably the biggest lesson I've learned from World War II veterans is it, it's, it's, it's about the greater good. It's about the, we as individuals do matter, but actually as a species, we matter a hell of a lot more. Mankind and humanity matters longer and more, and more permanently. And the other thing, because you asked me to, you turned it back on me. Mm. Um, you know, and I've met whatever it is, two and a half thousand World War II veterans or something over the years, um, is that they are as different as the rest of us. And sometimes books paint them all out to be incredibly patriotic fighting for their countries. And a lot of them actually would prefer to be at home, as you said earlier, roller skating or whatever, gardening. And, and, and I don't like them being used today to represent the views of one or other side because there there are there were left-wing veterans and right-wing veterans and gay ones and straight ones and ones that did a lot with their lives and a lot and a lot that did nothing with their lives and and the more you meet the more diverse you realize they all are and and it actually connects you to them because you realize you're going to meet one who's similar to you a lot of them you look at them and you go oh my god i could never be like you but then you meet one and you go actually he's a little bit like me you know, he's, a, he's an actual innate coward who didn't want to be there at all, but found in himself or herself the strength to do these remarkable things. And you go, you know what, maybe I could do something. Um, so, yeah, no, it's the, 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 the lessons you've managed to pass on without preaching. Your books don't preach, um, which I think is, is, is important as well. Um, so, um, people, I'm just checking the questions we've had coming in. People are answering their own questions. Are so people answering questions? And there are other guests are answering the questions. So we had about what unit the Panthers were in. That's now been asked and answered. Um, Elizabeth's watching it. So there's at least one maker's watch it. Kevin Hemel's watching it. Um, let's go back to the, the the art, the artwork. I think we have. We said we'd do that at some point. Uh, Vanna Studios. If if there's if there's one name that is out there that is considered a reputable art company that treats the veterans properly and does historically accurate prints, it's Valor Studios. And I think you can be very proud of yourselves for what you've done with that as well. And that's the whole Makos growing clan. What was your, when you, when you and your brother and sisters started that and your dad and mom and everybody else, what was the, you wanted to bring art into people's living rooms, but what was the, what were the kind of three principles you stuck to at the beginning uh, is there is there some code of honor you established hmm. well one thing we've done paul that that's we've never wanted to glorify war so the valor studios business began as a lot of in a lot of ways as a way to keep the lights on if you want to write these stories that it's very altruistic and just i want to tell this guy's story you still got to be able to pay the electrical bill you still got to be able to put food on the table while you're researching or while you're trying to do these, these more altruistic deeds. And so, so Valor Studios was about funding our little magazine, funding our stories, and it still is. So, so I, I still work for Valor Studios. I help design the artwork like pieces behind me. Mm -hmm. And I do it so that, um, you know, because as you know, it, sometimes being an author, uh, you know, you have great moments, but at the end of the day, it's a job. And, and, and it's sometimes it's Sometimes it pays well, and, and some books don't go over so great. I wrote one about the Korean War, Devotion, and there's not a lot of Korean War buffs out there. Now, we made people love the Korean War. They came to discover the Korean War, but they weren't just saying, please give us a Korean War book. They wanted World War II. So it allows you to do those kind of passion projects. Um, one thing, a principle you might say, you know, you can kind of see it here. Um, there's nobody necessarily stomping over the dead SS man, you know, um, in Holland. There's no, 
picture of a guy bayoneting a German in Carentan. You know, Clancy Lyle, our friend, you know, I remember he got stabbed in the leg there by a German bayonet and he shot the German with his pistol. And you just say to yourself, okay, well, is that going to be a painting? No, we show moments. A lot of our paintings, if you look at them, they're moments of triumph. They're moments of, um, you know, guys before they go off to battle. Dick Winters said something really powerful. Um, when we did a painting of him and his buddies standing in front of their plane, uh, that he later on signed the prints for us. I mean, it was like literally he was handing us lottery tickets. His autograph was like gold. He said, you know, when I look at that painting, that's the last time we were all together. He saw something in it that, that we never saw. So these paintings mean a lot to the veterans. Uh, and they also tell a story. And usually it's a story of, of um, something uplifting. So this scene, Company of Heroes, is one that I'm quite proud of. It's a scene we designed with Bill Garnier and Babe Heffron, uh, two of the Band of Brothers veterans. It was actually, Bill, Bill was saying, you know, you got to do one of a cemetery. And we said, wait a second, how are we going to do a painting of a cemetery? And Babe would say, yeah, that's where, you know, the guys who are there are forever young. Those are the heroes. Mm. Those are the heroes. And I kept hearing it from Bill and Babe. Those are the heroes. They said, do a painting for them. I thought, how do I do a painting of a cemetery? And then we came up with this idea. We actually took the Band of Brothers veterans over to Europe a couple times. One time we took them to visit the United States. Uh, I want to say, uh, I can't remember what armored division was, but we went, took them to Germany, literally at Christmas time, to visit some guys who had just come back from Iraq. So our company's always been about giving back. So we probably took $30,000 and spent it flying the vets to, to visit some American troops. Well, while we were there, we went to the cemetery in Luxembourg. And I got to watch Bill and Babe and the guys, how they, how they interacted with it. Um, I remember Babe, you know, he, he, did, he wanted to be left alone. He said, I'm going to go to the grave I need to go to. Leave me alone. And he kind of wandered off. And you know, I think he was going to Julian's grave, Julian's John. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in, in Luxembourg there, and and so um, you know, he dealt with it his way, and I got to see that from a distance. Um, I got to see Earl McClung. We took him to Normandy with you, and we got to see him at Salty Harris's grave. Salty Harris was, of course, an Easy Company NCO who got transferred out of the company after the Sobel mutiny, and he ended up dying uh, D-Day itself. And so we got to see Earl stand there in his jump jacket at Salty Harris's grave. So you get to see how Babe dealt with it and how Earl, who's in this scene, how he dealt with it. Don Malarkey dealt with it differently. And, and that was uh, when we were there with you, Paul. I remember Don would not go into the American cemetery in Normandy. Yeah, he, he stayed with Erica in the van, didn't he? Stayed in the van with my sister. And with one of those original sweets, uh, candy, as I recall. Oh yeah, yeah. And Eric and he were, were were thick as thieves. And Don dealt with it differently. He said, "I don't want to see those graves. I don't want to see their our friends buried there." He was kind of actually he was a little bit rubbed raw by Europe at the time. Um, you know, there were a lot of times when Europeans I think have have totally um, they've totally forgotten that a lot of young American boys came over for a war that. You know, some Americans said back then, oh, we don't need to be in this. You know, why are we going over there to fight for, you know, another people? But they had that view. Our, our soldiers had that view that you did, Paul, and that was the greater good. We're, we're part of humanity. That's why they have to go liberate Dachau. That's why they have to storm the beaches of France. That's why they have to bomb the ball bearing factory uh, in Regensburg. That's, we have to go and risk our lives for other people. So Don watched his friends die. He watched them be buried in French soil. And he said, you know what? I don't know if the French really give a damn about America today. That was his attitude. Now, now Bill would have felt differently. Bill, Bill loved the French and Bill loved going over there. Don sat in the van and he said, I don't know if it was worth it. We've got this little piece of land here. He said, our guys come over, they die. We go home, we give everything back to the people. You know, we give Holland back to the Dutch. We give France back to the French. And you know what? 67 years later, they laugh at us and they sneer at us. And a lot of now I'm not saying in, in Normandy, they understand in Normandy, but there are parts of Europe. I was in Bastogne once and some Belgians when I walked in with Shifty Powers and Earl McClung, they're wearing their jump jackets. I was with a couple American soldiers, so the numbers were kind of on our side. But there's a table of Belgian men. They're talking 30 to 60. 
and they were having their, you know, the Germans have a Stammtisch where they hang out and they just drink and talk. And these Belgians were doing the same thing. And I want to say there were about a dozen of them in the back of the restaurant. And don't you know, they were, they were sneering and they were laughing and they were cracking jokes in their language about the group of Americans, two American soldiers in camo and two old World War II veterans who had liberated their town, who had fought in, in, in the outside of Foy, who had knocked out German snipers, who had done patrols in the snow. The actual battle bastards of Bastogne were standing in their restaurant and they were sitting there sneering. Now they had us outnumbered. Earl and Shifty were in their 80s, but I, I wouldn't- but Earl's worth a good dozen, isn't he? I mean, you, with Earl there, you, you'd have been fine. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think we had to hold back because Earl would have probably killed the half of them himself. But um, I've been laughed at in the company of World War II veterans by the people they liberated. And so that's why Don stayed in the car or in the van. And, uh, and that's why, like you said, every veteran is not that guy in Saving Private Ryan kneeling at the grave saying, you know, I hope I was a good man. I hope it was worth it. Some say, I don't know if it was worth it. Some say it was definitely worth it. Every person is going to take a different experience from it. But my, my overarching theme, I guess I would say, is as a young American, I've woken up to the idea that guys in their 20s went off and, end, and their lives ended. You see some, I've always been fascinated by the widows, the war widows, who went their whole lives never remarrying. There was one in, in, in Dallas, and she was a, her husband was a P-51 pilot who died in France. She never remarried, whole life. And there's, that's not, there's not just one. And Billy story. Harris's wife, yeah? No, I think it yeah. might have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, yeah, she passed away quite recently, a lot year ago. Yeah, yeah, amazing yeah. woman. And so the, these the life froze for some people. And so, anyway, I'm appreciative of that, and I know a lot. Most Europeans are, and and I think that that's that's what through these stories. I, I I think that's all it is. It's about not about hero worship. It's about honoring the sacrifice and and appreciating the sacrifice. And you have yeah, to understand the story. And it was it was Don Malarkey's absolute right to go back and think he, what he thought. And mm -hmm. in a sense, they also fought for the right of those Belgians to think what they wanted to think about the USA. Really, that's that's what when you have kids, I haven't got kids, I've got two stepdaughters, one's in the other room. But when they go and do their stuff, all you can do is let them live their life. And so Europe is doing what Europe is doing. And We've got Brexit going on in Britain and what have you. And all you can do is allow countries to progress the way they decide to. There was America and Britain and Canada and France and all these countries were here on June the 6th to, to give back the right for these countries to live just to how, however the hell they wanted to with whatever decisions they want to make. And it's, we couldn't sit there. And it's one of the things that always talks to me about um, when people say it happened just tour guides all the time. I'm sorry for hogging the conversation, bringing it back to you. And people say, why are those people on Omaha Beach sunbathing? Don't they know what happened there? And we always go, well, yes, of course they know what happened there. It's also a really fantastic beach. There was a pleasure beach before the war, and it's a pleasure beach now. And if we only look at that as a strip of sand where people died, what was it all for? How can you, how do we dare tell people who live near that beach that they can't have their children go and walk on that beach because they've got to pay some eternal debt to the men who fought there? Well, then, then, what was it for if they have no freedom? The, the right is to go on that beach and enjoy it for what it was meant for, which is to have fun on. I mean, I'm not saying beaches are meant for that, but if you believe in greater powers, then, then that beach is there for fun. So, and then, and then when you want to go and pay your respects, go to a cemetery and lay some flowers. And, 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 and yes, some people, when we tell them that, they go, no, they still shouldn't be there. They should never be there on that beach door. It's sacred ground. And you go, okay, you're in, absolutely entitled to that opinion. I think you're wrong. But I'm entitled to think they're wrong, and they're entitled to think I'm I'm wrong for suggesting it. So it's uh, yeah, we'll bring it back to your books. But that's what your your books paint these pictures. I'm not going to use warts and all, but you get to know the people beyond just the surface. Their 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 character faults as well as their their heroism, if you like. And um, so yeah, that's an interesting concept. So um, the veterans you the, the guys you've met with your books now and i know you've done you know signing tours and you've had these amazing things where you've had tanks in main streets in the states now and you've 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 the 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 veterans you've written about have had opportunities to to travel as as you were saying we're taking easy company veterans to uh to, to germany to meet uh, veterans um 
is it, it's obviously important to you that the veterans get something out of it as well. I mean, when you tell their story, do you think it's a cathartic process for them as well? Oh yeah, Paul. And, and before I, I answer that one thing, bef- just to, in all fairness, I remember when we went to Bastogne with the veterans, um, we were at a ceremony. It was uh, outside the, the war memorial there. And I remember a, a young Belgian uh, reenactor coming up and he had a, he had a photo in his hand and he was going through looking for any, any Americans um, who, uh, who might've showed up. And he had like trading cards almost, um, these photos were. And, uh, and he was looking for Shifty Powers. Well, we actually had Shifty Powers there. And so it was quite remarkable because he's got these trading cards of the guys he's hoping are gonna be there. And he comes up to Shifty Powers and he says, Shifty Powers, Shifty Powers? And he's got the card and he's holding, he's holding the wartime photo and there's Shifty standing right next to him. And you should have seen his face. I mean, he almost broke into tears. So for every eight or 12 bad guys sitting in the back of the restaurant, there were 2000 people there wanting to meet these guys and wanting to celebrate them. And so it's so important to remember that sometimes the bad eggs are the ones who stand out. And that's one of the big problems with the media is that we hear the doom and gloom, we hear the worst stories and it's celebrated. But really, we don't think of the 2,000 people that, that were out on a snowy day to honor the Americans who fought there. So that goes for France. It goes for, for Belgium. It yeah. goes for Germany now. So um, we, 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 we started yeah. on about a student that we went off on a tangent there, which is absolutely yeah. fine. But um, your prints, you know, you cover airborne operations and landings on the beaches. And you've mentioned the Vietnam War with the, uh, the Aya Drang Valley and what have you. Um, is, is it still as exciting when you're working on a, uh, commissioning a painting with, you know, you work with the likes of, of Larry Selman and these other guys, is it still exciting getting the proofs back now, however many years into it with how many prints behind you? Is, does it still give a buzz? Oh yeah. I mean, I, anytime you tell a, a World War II story and the people are there to enjoy it, in this case, the people being the veterans. So when you get to the best part of whether it's making a painting or writing a book, it's, putting it in the veteran's hands. So that's why, you know, I've, I've written four of them and uh, in a very short amount of time, we're talking nine years, four books. Um, and I'm not just only working on one new book, I'm actually working on a few. I'm trying to get a lot of interviews done now so I can tell these stories for years to come. So I've, I've got a lot of irons in the fire, but the best part is handing, handing the book to Clarence Smoyer for the first time. Or as you mentioned, when we had the tanks rolling down through the streets, a lot of people don't know that the way we promoted Spearhead, how do you take a story that happened 74 years ago and make it relevant? Well, uh, you know, a lot of people wouldn't say a veteran writes his book or a veteran story is finally told is worth of the nightly news. So we said, all right, how are we going to do this? We're going to make news. We're going to make people care. We're going to make them pay attention. Here's what we're going to do. When Clarence goes to his book signing in Boston, When he steps out of his hotel, instead of an Uber being there or a taxi, you know what's gonna be waiting to take him to his book signing? A Sherman tank. And so our friends at the American Heritage Museum, we arranged to bring a Sherman tank in, Clarence steps outside and there's his old Sherman tank. And he climbs aboard for the first time since World War II for his first tank ride. And it goes around the country. The AP covers it in the local Boston press. And then we said, okay, When Clarence comes home to Allentown, we're going to do a book signing there. But you know what? He never got a homecoming when he came home from World War II. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to make some more news and we're going to surprise him again. Clarence, it was probably a Wednesday morning when he heard the sound coming down the street outside of his house. And his daughter said, his daughter said, Dad, that sounds like a tank. Uh, Or no, he said, it sounds like a tank. And she said, Dad, we're in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's not a tank. She, she made him think he was crazy for a minute there. Sure enough, it was a Sherman tank. And we're talking narrow streets of, of an old working class community there. And this Sherman tank pulls up to his doorstep. And Clarence steps outside. And who's there? The local police honor guard, a dozen reenactors, 50 to 100 of his neighbors and friends. And they're all cheering for him. And he comes out and we gave him a homecoming. So he gets aboard the Sherman tank. He rides it through the streets of Allentown to the VFW that he always goes to. And he gets out and we had a cake for him and we had a party. And um, 
And he got the homecoming that he never had because when he came home in World War II, uh, late summer 1945, he just came home to an empty train station. The parades were already over. The first batch of GIs had come home from Europe. And he just walked home with his duffel bag over his shoulder, up the steps to his parents' house, knocked on the door, came inside. That was his victory parade. So we decided to change that. Uh, we later brought a Sherman tank to Washington, D.C. We brought a Stewart tank to Denver. Uh, we had brought a, a Sherman tank to Allentown, Pennsylvania. And Clarence became known for riding tanks in American cities. And you know what? It was damn good fun. Uh, the ultimate thing, though, the ultimate success was when I was reading the book, I, I, I was amazed that he didn't get a medal for knocking out the Panther. Whether it was, you know, the German crewman being disoriented or whether it was Clarence's quick thinking, it was a brave thing. It was caught on film. They destroyed the last German tank threatening the American army. The battle was over after that. They won the Battle of Cologne right there. And he never was recognized. So we set about working with the U.S. Army to try to get him the Bronze Star he deserved that he never got all those years earlier. The reason he didn't get the Bronze Star was really a funny story. A couple of days after Cologne, he was wandering through the rubble. He had already been nominated for the Bronze Star. And they had a rule that said no fraternization, no talking to the German women, of course, no talking to the German kids, no talking to the old Germans. They are the enemy. We have to show them that we're not going to be their friends because they brought Hitler to power. That was our idea. And so Clarence is walking through the rubble, kind of sightseeing, and he comes across these kids that are playing and their mother or their caregiver is sitting on the steps, a young woman. And the kids come up to him and they start pulling on his on his pants uh, leg and they pull on his sleeve and they say, bubble gum, bubble gum, because they just assume every American GI is carrying gum. Well, Clarence didn't have any. So he's turning his pockets inside out. He's kind of shooing them toward their mother when an MP Jeep comes around the corner. And they said, look at this, American GI talking to German kids, talking to their mother. He's probably, you know, trying to, you know, sway her with cigarettes or chocolate. And they wrote him up and uh, his commanding officer called him in and lectured him about it. And that bronze star paperwork got ripped up. So mm. his commander got the bronze star, the cameraman who filmed it got the bronze star, but the man who pulled the trigger never did. So many years later, we were able to get him the bronze star and the army did something really cool. We made a case to him. We said, uh, you know, here's the reasons he should get it. And here's the film of his crew knocking out this panther. And they said, well, there's a problem. They said, heroism is usually recorded when you can see somebody do the deed. A witness says, you know, I watched him charge that machine gun nest and, and kill five Germans. Well, we didn't have that. The men inside of his tank were all dead. So they said, how can we really say that he pulled the trigger and destroyed the panther tank and won the battle for Cologne? Well, we said, you know, we got to think outside the box here. Look at the film. You can see the tank shooting the German Panther. You can see the American crew coming out of the tank. You can see Clarence there with his, he's got the curly hair. You can see Bob Early tip his helmet. You can see uh, Smokey, um, Smokey Gordon, you know, just, uh, you know, puffing away on a cigarette. You can see all the, all the faces, you know who was there. And they said, damn it, you're right. We're going to give the whole crew the Bronze Star. Everyone is going to get the Bronze Star because even if we can't prove that one man did it, we know they were all there. We know they did it as a team. And they, they said, you know, the Army is all about teamwork. Somebody had to drive that tank. Somebody had to load that shell. Somebody had to pull the trigger. Somebody had to command it. And the guy in the bow gun, you know, he was there. He was keeping an eye out for, for trouble ahead. They were one fighting organism. They were in symbiosis. They were a team. And you know what? They knocked it out together. So five bronze stars were eventually awarded to that tank crew. Four of them were awarded last September in Washington, D.C. We threw a big ceremony at the World War II Memorial, and it was a lot of fun because we told Clarence, um, we told him he was going to a book signing at the Pentagon. That's how I got him to Washington. And uh, I said, all right, you ready for your book signing? You get all cleaned up. And we got him in a car, and we stepped out at the World War II Memorial. And he said, wait, this isn't the Pentagon. I said, no, it's not the Pentagon. There's 200 people and the U.S. Army and uh, everybody waiting for him uh, to walk up and get the Bronze Star. And then when he saw the Bronze Stars on the table, 
the boxes were all open, the red ribbons. There was not just one, it was four of them there. And we had the portrait of his tank crew there and that just wiped him out emotionally. So I learned, it's a great thing to get a guy a long overdue honor. He, I always used to joke, he sleeps with a bronze star on now. He doesn't, but um, at the same time, I learned you don't surprise a World War II veteran like that because it just, it, it, it was too much. I mean, it was literally, he was in shell, he was shocked for, wow. for hours that this had even happened. That's an amazing story and, uh, and, and well done for just getting across the idea that the Bronze Star is an, already an achievement because there's become an obsession recently with if it's not the Medal of Honor, it's not worthy. And, you know, you go, how ridiculous is that? That if you come away with a Bronze Star or two out of World War II, you've done incredibly well. You know, 16 million men in, and women in uniform and there's been a, this obsession with getting everybody a Medal of Honor. And of course, you can't give the Medal of Honor to everybody. The Medal of Honor is going to be for absolute exceptional stuff. And the Bronze Star is an amazing achievement. And mm -hmm. amazing army logic to actually give the, give the whole crew the Bronze Star. That's an ob obvious solution. To, to, but sometimes the authorities wouldn't think of something that, that amazing. And I, I, it, it, when you were telling that story, it made me think about the fact it seems to me, and I sound like an awful fanboy here, but I am a fan of yours and your family generally, uh -huh. is that you have been adamant about taking these veterans with you on the journey. And I think that's, that's to your credit, but I think it's part of the reason you've been successful because there are historians and, and authors who have used the veterans to tell the story and use the accounts. It's all been about them and what they want to say. And, and that's kind of fine to, to a certain extent, but you, you've, you've seen it as a journey that you've all gone on, uh, you and the veterans and their families and the descendants and I guess your family as well. And, and, and so it's a success of, you know, you're the writer, but it's, it's the veterans as well can feel proud that their role was significant in it. And um, yeah, and, and I'm going to repeat myself again, but uh, this, these, these themes, these strong themes you bring up are, are what sets your work apart. So uh, I'm just scanning the questions again. Someone asked how many Panthers there were in Cologne. That's already been answered by somebody else. That's good. Tim Blix is saying he loves everything Paul and Adam and Valor stand for and the work they do. How I wish everyone could have heard their discussion of those who sacrifice their best interests for the larger good. So, well, the more people are watching, that's them. I always say when you've seen this video, retweet it, put it on Facebook. We're still at the early days of this. It's all kind of a, a lockdown idea, these live streams, but I enjoy doing them and uh, people seem to enjoy coming on them. And um, so, yeah, and uh, subscribe to my channel. And if you would consider being a patron, that would be fantastic. Because all of these discussions, I tweeted this yesterday. Everything I ever do in terms of World War II content is always going to be free to everybody on YouTube. That is a principle I've, I've decided. I want these videos to be watched by 12-year-old kids as well as people who can afford to pay. Everything's free. That's it. That's my rule. And it may take me longer to get to a level of financial stability, but that's my, my ethics. Oh, the, the Baston print, or the, sorry, the cemetery print behind you there, Duncan, mm -hmm. who's also watched this, who's one of my camera people, Duncan was with a group of, I think it was 16, about the Bulge veterans last year in the Ardennes and that painting came up and they had, they had prints and things of it they were taking around with them and what was interesting is that for the veterans these are veterans of all different units they hadn't even noticed that that was an easy company print because to them it didn't matter who the guys were they just saw it as it could have been their buddies and I think that's what that print particularly why it stands apart is that it, it's although we can tell who the people are it's actually a universal picture that it could be third armored those guys there they could be they could even be british or canadian um soldiers visiting a commonwealth cemetery in the sense that that is a universal image you were you and your team were were getting across i forget who was the artist on that one adam i forget that was, that was a matt hall piece matt hall, yeah yeah i think you're right i think everybody can see uh see their grandfather there uh, even you know if you're, you're maybe your dad went and fought in vietnam and and you, it's about seeing the ghosts that, that we can't see that they can. And, and that's why I think it's so powerful because everybody who goes into battle, um, Clarence, you know, he bottled it up for, for 70 some years. Um, you know, those, those, those scars remain. And I think it's, um, you know, we've been able to see it because again, I've, I've taken him, like you said, we always, you're right. We, we do take the veterans on the journey with us. So the cool thing about Spearhead was this was not a World War II book that was researched by me calling a veteran, 
and just getting his oral history over the phone and saying, thank you, sir, and hanging up. This was getting to know him, going to his kitchen table, hanging out with him at his house, then taking him at the airport, flying him over. And in the case of Spearhead, we did our research for this book, where the battle happened. And we didn't just take Clarence with us. We took um, Buck Marsh, who was a young infantryman who used to ride Clarence's tank. And we took Chuck Miller. Um, you know, it was a, kind of the trip of a lifetime. It was like, uh, you know, you just saw these three old World War II veterans who literally fought in the same places, going back to the battlefield, and they gave me a great gift. They told their stories where it happened. So that's why Spirit, I'm so proud of it. You know, when I say that grove of trees is where the Panther tank was parked, uh, hiding out in, in the, the woods near Grand Sart, I know that because Chuck Miller told me that's where that German tank was. And that's where he fired from. And that's where he killed my commander. And my commander fell down and top of his head was missing and his blood and his brains poured all over me. And that's where we rolled out of the tank. And I rolled off the right side of the tank and see the stream over there. That's where we went because a German machine gun fire from, from Sartre started hitting around us. And that's where I crawled in the icy water after just covered in my commander's blood and brains. And so, yeah, I know where that German tank was because I saw it flash through my gun sight. And so that's where you get a book that it's, it's not just grandpa's war stories. I mean, this is, this is on the ground, visceral war, war stories that, that have as much authenticity as you can humanly achieve. The only way to, to make it better would have been to write it in 1945. And nobody wanted to talk about it back then. But you also, and you, you also do your research as well. I mean, I know, I know how, because I can tell it in your work, you don't just take what the veteran said. You would double check that with the morning reports and the aerial photos and the maps and things and, and make sure there's this harmony between uh, written fact from the war and veteran's testimony. And did, I mean, going back to our first question, we're back at the beginning of the interview, we talked about your interviews for the magazine back um, however many years ago that was. You must have realized, because you, you, you went to the air shows, things like that as well, didn't you, back then? You must have realized that when you get a veteran standing in front of a P-51, the story comes out better than it does if you're in his living room, or can do, it can do. So it's a, it, 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 not only is it brilliant for the veteran to take him to the battlefield, or not necessarily brilliant, uh, emotional, it could be, could be traumatic, but important, I suppose is a better word, you're mm -hmm. also going to get that much better stuff. And we, we see it as guides in the battlefields. When, when family members get quite grumpy with us because veteran tells us stuff in more detail at the field where he was shot than he's ever told them sitting around Sunday dinner. And, 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 they're, and they're kind of going, well, he's never told us before. You can just go shut up and listen to what he's saying and remember the fact it's a perfect um, symmetry now between he's talking to me, a complete stranger. He's in the place where it happened. He's on a journey just kind of if let the proverbial camera roll at this point and just see where it takes you so you you know your your apprenticeship speaking to veterans has obviously given you the skills to to um to know how to to get the best from them um and again you know te old testament to you that you've managed to do that so um without we'll, we'll bring it to an end in a few minutes i mean where you've got a, a book project you're on now what would be the well, uh, we sound like I'm a job interview now. Where do you where do you see yourself in ten years' time, Adam? But honestly, where where do you see you are? You know, because in ten years' time, uh, sadly, this generation is going to be pretty much gone. Um, we will have Vietnam veterans, we will have Falcon Islands veterans, we will have Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. But in ten years' time, where where do you, where will you be? Hmm, that's a great question, Paul. Um... One thing I'm hoping will happen is we've got we've got three of these stories in movie development. Now, development. So every you know every author you talk to, they have five or ten films in development. That can just mean somebody's talking about it out there at lunch. Um, in the case of Devotion, we've got a script written, which is great, and we've got a director and actors attached, and it's all announced. But each of the properties has something going for it. Um, the reason I can't talk about them is because it's actually real development. There's good stuff happening. There's directors attached. There's great writers. Um, but they say, you know, getting a war movie made is like, it's like winning the lottery. I mean, Hollywood moves mm -hmm. at a glacier speed. Um, and you've seen, you know, we, we've all seen properties that are supposed to become a movie. This one is going to be the next, you know, Band of Brothers and the next this. 
you know, we've seen the screenwriters going. I remember a few years ago, there screenwriters are touring the Battle of the Bulge. There's going to be a new tank movie set in the Battle of the Bulge, and we know there's uh, going to be there was supposed to be an 82nd Airborne Normandy story. And you hear these things and you get excited, and then you wonder why they just what happens. The reality is, you got to get somebody who's going to spend 50 million dollars on a movie. Um, these are difficult movies to make because a lot of times, you know, an aviation movie requires aviation and special effects and just any Hollywood movie can't be made for under 20 or 30 million dollars. So finding somebody to believe in, in, in your story, that, that takes something special. So I'm hoping that, that we get a movie going soon. The, the COVID thing has not helped. You know, we were supposed to have one in production in June. Um, that's, that's been pushed back now. Um, but my goal would be, I wanna just, um, I wanna bring these stories to larger audiences. The people who are reading these books in a lot of ways already appreciate these heroes. So my readers for Spearhead or a higher call, these are patriotic people, whether they're, they're Brits or French or American or Canadian, you know, these people get it. That's why they're reading it. They appreciate these heroes. They appreciate what happened all those years ago. They care about something that most of the world doesn't care about. And that's what peeves me the most, um, a world that's just, that's just concerned about football or, or clubbing or cars or jets or, or this song or that song, a world that's just concerned with frivolous stuff that forgets the stuff that matters. And the stuff that matters happened a long time ago and we, they, they think it happened in black and white and they think the people that it happened to you know, don't really matter. I wanna change that. I, I, want, I, want, I want kids in high schools to be, if they watch the movie Devotion or if they watch A Higher Call or if they watch Spearhead, I want them to be awoken to this thing that we love, this this uh, this World War II interest. Um, so that's my ultimate goal. Is uh, you might say education. It's 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 reaching the people that don't already love these guys, because I think that's what it comes down to. You have to. You love the veterans you you work with. That's why you tell their stories. That's why you take them back. You know, I love these guys too, um, and and that's why you I commit you know, my life to it. A lot of times writing a book for me process is lock myself in a room for 400 days in a row. Um, mm. the, the better stories are the ones where I don't leave the zone, where, where basically I live in that World War II world. I live with the documents and the oral histories and the interviews, and I'm piecing it back together for 300, 400 days without going to the beach, without going to a conference, without going to a book signing, literally, to, to live in that world and to process it and then to tell it. And so, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's why I kind of, you have to literally put yourself on hold. You have to say my life matters, but what matters more is the story. What matters more is seeing the story survive. So when you tell these stories on your YouTube channel, you're, you're doing something close near and dear to my heart. Uh, when, a, when these young people that are reading my book pass it to their father or to their friend at school, that's, that's as equally important. That's, that's what matters. We're all in it for the, for the same outcome, and that is um, to make sure that, uh, that these, these guys are never forgotten. It sounds cliche, but it's just that no, simple. And, and you're speaking to the, the choir here, pitching to the choir, and that's, that's exactly my, my idea because – and you've got to be on a multimedia front. I mean, you're already doing uh, books, uh, TV slots, art prints. I'm doing YouTube. Video games is another area. Movies. Hit is on as many fronts as possible. And that way you get the, you get the bigger audience. My second stepdaughter, Maddie, who's a couple of rooms behind me, she watched with her French friends a couple of hours of my D-Day live stream. Mm -hmm. Well, it was because it was me. But she watched two hours of it or so. Now, she'd be the first to admit she probably wouldn't pick up a book about World War II because she's more interested in films and, and, um, and other things and cooking and, um, and, and all sorts of uh, young people's changing the world principle. But uh, those two hours may have just dripped in a little bit and, uh, and that, that, that idea of appealing on different fronts and, uh, is, is, is key because people have access to YouTube who don't have access to um to books necessarily or libraries even these days which are are fast kind of disappearing so um yeah no i know all about the movie thing uh, the, my angels of mercy is is there's a there's a there's a nice little project bubbling away that i'm fingers crossed 
is actually mm -hmm. going to happen. I've had, I'm about, this is about the fifth or sixth version of things that may have happened, and they've all just uh, fizzled away like chalk paintings in the in the rain. And you you watch your eye, you, you watch your dream just disappear. But this time, fingers crossed, the people behind it are are in are are, are reliable and good and honest and want to do it. So that's good. So. Well, I think we've we've covered everything. Um, people are just so there. There's no particular questions for you or me. They're just being very complimentary about what we've done. Um, in fact, they're talking about football now, English soccer now. Two people have started on that now. Um, so I think we've we've accomplished everything. So for those who haven't, I can't believe you're watching this. You don't know Adam's book. For goodness' sake, go out there and get them because they're amazing. And I'm halfway through Spearhead and on on Kindle. I don't like reading on Kindle, but I I do, and I'm looking forward to the next one because it'll be immense because you are a very talented individual as you all are within your family. The, uh, the what your mum and dad were, 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 how they've given all of you so much incredible passion for world war two. What's in the, what was in the, in the water when you grew up, grew up, I have no idea, but it was a, a magic, magic childhood. You must've had. So Adam, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, have you anything you'd like to say to a live YouTube audience? Just the final closing remark, anything that you particularly want to get across? Well, uh, Paul, I guess um, I just, when I think of this World War II uh, interest, whether I go to a book signing or, or, or talk with you, um, I watched your, your live uh, D-Day live stream where, you know, I got to kind of see the bluffs on the day it happened from my living room here in Colorado. Um, I think we're all part of a, we all are part of a family here. I mean, we're, we're all people that, that appreciate the same thing and cherish it. And so for me, it's, um, it's an honor to have someone care enough to read my book. It's, it's an honor to, to have somebody show up when I do a book signing or, or to tune into something like this. Um, you know, I see, I, I don't see myself as the author and other people as the readers. I kind of see us all as, I don't want to say geeks in the same club, but, um, you know, enthusiasts, passionate people that uh, care about the same thing. So we all believe in the same, uh, I don't want to say the same religion, but um, this, this thing is more than a hobby. It's more than an enthusiasm. Uh, this, is, this is something that resonates in our souls. And so, yeah, we're all on the same page. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's, um, it's the old thing, isn't it? You can be watching TV and there can be a documentary about a subject you have absolutely no interest in whatsoever. But if the person is passionate about it themselves, suddenly you start feeding into what their passion is. And, like, and conversely, you can be watching a show about something you are interested in and the person seems to be going through the motions and you switch off after 10 minutes. And the same with, same with books. Mm -hmm. you know, I, there, there's, I, I hate not finishing books, but I'm afraid I'm, I'm busy enough now with things that sometimes I will just end up putting a book on the shelf. Go, yeah, okay. I just can't. I can't continue with that. It's painful. Oh, it doesn't yeah. happen very often. And normally you get something out of them. But suddenly you go, no, that's it. That's just on the shelf. And other ones you just blitz through them in two days, as I as I did with. Um, I mean, I I actually I I really liked devotion. I I liked higher higher call. The problem is not a problem. I had read about the story before, so it wasn't quite a surprise. Mm -hmm. Devotion. And I didn't even read the blurb on the back. I I I just dived in, and I and I'm not. I know virtually nothing about the Korean War apart from Bridges at Toko Ri and uh, and Pork Chop Hill, the movies, really. And so I I had no idea where it was going to go and what the story was going to be. So I find that one, but found that one particularly um, thrilling because it was telling me something new. So, uh, but of course, Higher Call is a classic. Anyway, I'm rambling now. I think we'll draw it to an end. Um, it's Saturday evening in France here, so people are going to have other things to do. Those watching it in the States, enjoy your afternoon. Those in the UK, enjoy your evening. Adam, I would love to get you on again. When, it, when, the, when the fourth project, fifth project is coming out, um, can, I, can I get a nice exclusive early interview? Can I, can I be one of the first? Can I? Can I? Please, oh, please, oh, pretty oh, please. All right, best buddies. It would be, it would be a joke. <laughs> all I can say to you and everybody out there is uh, I'll try to surprise you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, I you told me a little bit, and it's fantastic. So brilliant. Um, people are coming. There's praise coming in for a higher call. Uh, absolutely loved it. Lizzie Powell is staying. Um, and at least two people have decided to buy Spearhead just through this interview. So there you are. There's a couple of quid in the coffers for you today. That's just live. There'll be people watching it again tomorrow. So anyway, um, for those watching it again, um, it's been a pleasure to have Adam here. I'm doing a live stream from uh, north of Caen tomorrow afternoon with. Mark Forsdyke, who wrote an excellent book about the Suffolk Regiment. 
We're going to talk about a battle that took place 76 years ago tomorrow, live from the battlefield with two cameras showing the wheat fields where 160 yard men of the Suffolk Regiment killed or wounded, wounded. So join us for that one. On Monday, we have got our uh, air power in Normandy special. And then I'm working other ones right now. We've got a Battle of Atlantic one coming up. We've got Verrier Ridge, uh, the Canadian story with David O'Keefe coming up. We've got a rations special we're working on talking about K rations and how they uh, affect men in combat and calorie content, British rabbit. We've got that coming up. So lots of things coming up. I'm working on more interviews, more live streams. Um, so, but that, for that, thanks for watching. This is Paul Woodadge and Adam Makos uh, for World War II TV. It's been extraordinary. I'll end the stream now. Remember that the Adam's website is in the, in the description of the video below. Uh, you can find and a Valor Studios link is there as well. If you've got any questions, uh, hook me up on Twitter and Facebook and thank you for watching. And again, thank you, Adam, and give my love to all the Makos clan and, uh, and they're, they're all great people. And I'm, I'm definitely in the Makos fan club and I don't, and I'm unashamedly there and I don't care. So there we are. I'm a fan of yours, Paul. We're working Cheers, then. We'll talk soon. I will end, end the stream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. We're done, Adam. That's it. The live thing is done.